Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I hope everyone is doing well today. If you're not, you're deceived. <laughs> because in eternity, you're doing just fine. I want to share something with you. Um, we might even get to the message. I don't know. We'll see where this goes. Matthew chapter 23. You can turn there if you want. Jesus lists what, what is known as the seven woes. And we look at these woes and we, we read them in the past tense. We read them directed to the scribes and the Pharisees. Um, I think they're appropriate for today as well. And I'm just going to read this passage. I'm just going to read it through. If God gives me anything other to say after, I'll share that with you. But what I want you to do is I want you to put yourself in the place of the scribes and Pharisees and see if any of this applies to you. Okay? See if it might speak to something that is going on in your life. Because in reading over this, there are a number of things that God has convicted me of. Okay? So starting in verse 1, it says, And then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to more to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. And they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's face, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across the sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice, a much, twice as much a child of the hell as you yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools. For which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guide straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and plate, 
but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, then the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding of the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourself that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. I am always amazed when God lays something on my heart and I, I don't speak it to anyone. I, I just ponder it and I meditate on it. And we come to church on Sunday and Steve and Angie have selected songs that deal with exactly what God has laid on my heart. Uh, our memory verse gives indication of that because there is only one spirit that is in us. The same spirit that lives in me lives in you. There should be a commonality, right? Right? We're, we're one body, one spirit, one God and Father of all. So there should be commonality. Yeah, there's going to be differences. You're not me. Thank God for that. I'm not you. I thank God as well. I got my own problems. We all struggle in many ways. We all stumble. We all fall. Proverbs, it says that a wise man or a righteous man stumbles seven times. And what? Gets back up. Back to his feet. But I believe some of us have stumbled and are laying in the dirt. And we lack the will, the heart, to rise back to our feet. <clears throat> I believe we dress ourselves up in white linen and we're leprous. And sin has riddled our bodies. And we've embraced it. And we've just said that's the way it's going to be. And I want to share with you that's a lie. That's a lie. Satan wants you to believe that you will never overcome your sin. That you're stuck. It will never get better than this. This is as far as you will go in the righteous walk that God has set before you. This far and no further. God says, that's a lie. The enemy is the father of lies and he has no truth in him. Because God has told us in his word, victory is done. It is accomplished. It is finished. It has been paid. Listen, when he went on the cross and he shed his blood and he gave up his life, 
He didn't say this far and no more. He said, Father, the price is paid in full. In the Old Testament, it says that in that day, God will take from you your hearts of stone. Hearts that don't even recognize what sin is. That can't recognize what sin is. That don't understand the separation. God is going to take those away and He is going to give you a heart of flesh. But He's not just going to give you a heart of flesh. He's going to write His commands on them. And you will know Him. See, God has not called us to be a defeated people. We're humble, yes. We're not humiliated. We're humble because we stand in the light of the almighty, sovereign creator of the universe and we understand our relative positions. The only value we have is the value He has given us. And what value it is that God would choose before the foundation of the earth to make a way for us to be valued, to be esteemed. Do you understand that? God esteems you. God loves you. I'm not talking about this ethereal, out there in space kind of love that we just can't grasp. I'm talking about an overwhelming, all-consuming, from the bottom of our feet to the top of our head, and flowing out from us kind of love. Do you understand that? Do you understand that if you will open yourself to the things that God desires of you, you cannot help but impact the world around you because it's going to exude out from you. It is going to boil up out of you. People are going to look at you and go, wow, there's something weird about you. Because you will be different. You will be noticeably, markedly different than the people of this world. You have to be. You cannot have God's Spirit living inside of you and not be different. If your fruit is the same fruit that they have, can the same spring produce both salt and sweet water? It can't. I don't get me wrong. We still stumble. God has made us perfect. God has made us before Him to stand in righteousness. Not my righteousness. Thank God for that. It's not our righteousness. The Scripture says our righteousness is as filthy rags. Who wants those? It's His righteousness. Perfect. Pure. Holy, completely separate and unique. It's His. And then He starts this process of rebuilding us. And part of that process is, in, in Mark, it says that we are to take up our cross daily. We subject the old man. We say, no, you have no place in this life. You understand that being a Christian involves an act of will. God has already given an act of will on His part. The door is open. You have an act of will to choose to live like it or not. And every day, sometimes in my life, I feel like every minute of every day, I'm having to choose. No, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not going to think that. No, I'm not going to be that. Because God has given me better. God has taken from me those things and replaced them with these. God help me today to live in these and not those. See, the church all too often has become the scribes and the Pharisees. 
the hypocrites. We, we, we belong to a mutual admiration society where we get together and we speak the same words and we sing the same songs and read the same translation and pat each other on the back and say what good people we are. All the while disdaining those outside. I can say thank God I am not one of them but if that's where I stop, I fall into sin. I fall into error. See, it should begin with thank God that you have taken me out of that. I am not there anymore. But then the drive should always be to go back in. To go back and put that same hope that I received back out there for them. Are we willing to go out and be different and be weird? Allow them to see the weirdness of who we are? The world doesn't understand it. It's a stench to them. It stinketh much. They don't get it. But if we pull that out from them, what hope do they have? What hope? They wander lost in the darkness and there's no one to bring the light. Are we more concerned with keeping ourselves unpolluted by withdrawing? Or are we concerned that we're going to, let's go out and, and maybe face a little bit of dirt. God can sustain us in the pollution. Okay? Trust me. If he can take away the pollution that was inside of you, he can sustain you from the pollution outside of you. God does not call cowards. God doesn't call the equipped. You say, well, well Pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm not gifted with evangelism. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being what you were created to be. A light. A light. Salt. Don't deny what you are. Don't reject what He has made you into. Accept it. Be glad. Because this is the light of life that lives in us. And all too often we walk out those doors and we shudder the light. Look, we don't need these lights on today. The sun's out. The sun's out. We don't. The, the, the lights are a very little benefit. But you come back 11 o'clock tonight, those lights are valuable. They're necessary. They're important. And I tell you the truth, the same spiritual condition exists absolutely fantastic that you guys bring your light in here to shine. But if you shudder when you walk out there, it's of no use. The light drives out the darkness. The darkness has not overcome it. That's the light that lives in us. We're victorious. We're not defeated. Yeah, they're not all going to accept it. Some of them are going to reject it. Some of them are going to frown on us. They might even call you bad names. Bad words. What do we do? Shutter the light? No. What does Jesus tell us we should do? What? <coughs> Rejoice! Rejoice! Take a lesson from Peter. Man, he's brought up before the Sanhedrin and they say, hey, you've got to quit talking about this Jesus. Can't do it. <coughs> Sorry. It's not going to happen. All right, beat him and turn him loose. And they walked out rejoicing. Why? For being counted worthy to suffer on his behalf. And we're afraid of somebody bad mouthing us? What? You esteem yourself so much that you can't be bad mouthed for the sake of the cross? Do you really believe 
you inherently have so much value that you can't take a smack on behalf of God? Really? Because really, who are they attacking? It's not you. Man, if I pick up a hammer and pound in a nail, all the hammer is is a tool. Okay? I'm the one driving the hammer. I'm the one that makes the hammer work. All you are is a tool. Are you going to be an effective tool or are you going to be a useless tool? Are you a hammer made of a thin reed? Or are you going to be made of hickory? Are you going to be useful to the master's hand? Or are you going to be useful to the master's hand? Are you willing to be used however he wants? What if God should choose to make you a rubber band? I wanted to be a hammer. <laughs> Are you willing to be whatever he asks of you and be willing to give it everything that you've got? Or are you so proud that you decide, oh, I don't want to be used that way, God. Use me like this or not at all. Use me in this capacity or don't. Uh, do, you, do you hear the pride in that? Do you hear the pride to speak to the Almighty God? First, just consider Almighty God. Don't even consider what He's done. Just consider who He is. That you would speak to Him and put conditions on how you are to be used. What he can and can't do with you? Are you willing, like Paul said, to be put on display at the end of the line as one's going sentenced to death? To be made mockery of? Are you willing to do that? Or do you want to be up at the front, the place of honor? Do you want the best seat in the synagogue because you deserve it? Really? What, what do we deserve? What do we deserve? Right there. That's what we deserve. Now let's consider what he's done. He took our place there. He chose to go there willingly. Willingly. Looking forward to this. He chose it. He embraced it. He went in our place. You think he didn't have anything better to do that day? <clears throat> so are you willing to be what he asks you to be? I'm asking you to consider what Jesus just called and warned the scribes and the Pharisees. Because see, this is where we are at a lot of times. God, this far I will go and no further. Whether it be sin that entangles you, and you can't find the victory over it, press into God. Press into God. Press into God. Whether it be pride, because you feel like there should be something better for you. What's better than being useful? What better than to have the Master say, well done. God, I don't want to work in the fields. I want to wait tables. But it's the fields that are ripe under harvest. Pray that God would send workers into the field. We have too many people standing around the table accomplishing nothing. And insufficient people going out into the harvest. Look, I'm not, I'm not calling you to go door to door. Hey, if God lays that on your heart, let me know, I'll go with you. <coughs> Scared to death, but I'll go with you. But what about 
talking to your family? What about living that light that you shine so brightly in here before them? What about your coworkers? What about the lady that keeps getting your order wrong at McDonald's and putting onions on your hamburger? That woman needs prayer. <laughs> she needs the light that I have. Right? But, but you know, that, that, that's funny. But isn't it so easy to justify being angry at that person? Really, because of onions? We know onions are the devil. But you can scrape them off. Are, are we willing to let our light be dimmed? Diminish? Folks, God has called us to be victorious. We need to redefine what victory is. Because we tend to think of victory as everything going well. That people like us, that all the bills are paid, that we're able to get a new car and live in a nice house. Then we think God is happy with us. All too often, that leads us to a place where we no longer need God. We have become our own God. We look at all I've accomplished. Look at, I've got a new car. It's better than their car. Until next week. Look at, look at I'm, I'm making good money. I'm supporting my family. I'm doing this, and I've got that, and I've got the other. What does it say in the Old Testament? Father, do not give us too much that we would boast in ourselves or give us too little that we would be tempted to steal. But let us be content with what we have. Okay? See, all of these things that he just listed out are because the scribes and the Pharisees had it figured out. They had it figured out. They had a culture, an identity in their culture that said, you're important. Everybody looks up to you. And they started to believe that. We are important. Why were they important? What gave them value? That was the work they were doing. And when they started thinking they were important, the work that they were doing started to change, and it's very essential. Because the work that they were doing was no longer be like God, it was be like me. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, because Paul says that, follow me as I follow God. But when you're not following God, you're putting yourself up as a <coughs> false God. You are asking people to divert from the path that God has intended to follow you. Lame, really? What do you have to offer me? How are you going to keep me out of hell? Even if you went to the cross in my place, you're insufficient. Because you're not perfect. Your blood is not pure. One passage I want to share with you in particular. Verse 27, he said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but they are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Now, I want you to understand. I know that not one of you is perfect. I know every one of you struggles. I'm pretty honest up here. I struggle all the time. All the time.
I fall often. Which speaks to the magnitude of God's grace. Because when I fall, He is faithful to pick me up, brush me off. When I repent, when I confess, He is faithful to forgive me. But when we come in here, appearing beautiful outwardly, when we're struggling, we're hurting, and we don't dare let anyone know. You know, it's been said that the Christian army is the only army that kills its wounded. And that's a dangerous thing because there's nobody in the Christian army that hasn't been wounded. The church has been too eager to find somebody that is hurting, that is struggling, that is dealing with something and ostracize them, bash them, remove them from fellowship. Whether formally, you can't come in here anymore, or informally by just not having anything to do with them, just staying away from them. Listen, I'm not saying there's not a place or a time for that. But what is the point of that? What is the point of that? The point is always redemption. Always. Always. The hope is always that by removing them from the blessing of covenant of grace, when they are outside of that covering, that life will become so absolutely miserable that they will come running back to the cross and fall on their face and receive grace just as we have. That is always the sole purpose that they would be redeemed, that they would be restored, <coughs> that that life would be saved. Okay? <clears throat> But when you come in and you're struggling and you're hurting and you have areas of weakness that you cannot deal with on your own and you put on a facade, you take that shield painted with your smiling face and set it boldly in front of you and don't let anybody through. You are hindering the work of God not only in your life but you are hindering it in the life of the church. You are preventing somebody from being able to fulfill the ministry that God has called them to, perhaps in your life. And that's pride. I can deal with this. I can handle this. I speak personally because I, I don't like people to know when I'm struggling with anything. Ever. I wish this wasn't on my foot. I wish I didn't have those things. Not because I'm tired of a broken leg, but because I don't want people asking me about it. I don't want people to know about it. I'm wearing it. I wasn't going to. But there's a certain group of people sitting over here about fourth or fifth row that Christian reminded me would be looking. <laughs> and it's pride. It's my pride. I can deal with this on my own. Thank you. No, I can't. If I could deal with it on my own, if you could deal with it on your own, why would God call us to be one body? Not 2.6 billion bodies, but one <coughs> body. Joshua writes, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether it be the gods of your forefathers or the gods of the Amorites in the land you are now living. 
but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I want to lay this before you today. Choose today who you will serve. Whether it be whatever God you have established in your life, the pursuit of money, the pursuit of comfort, the pursuit of popularity, whether it be yourself, whether it be your family. I spoke about that a couple weeks ago, how somehow over the course of time, my family had replaced God as the number one priority in my life. And when God showed me that, it broke my heart. Because that was actually one thing I told Christy before we got married. That I will never love you more than I love God. And when he showed me that I did, that, that, that was hard. So I would say to you today, These passages are hard, they're difficult, they're confrontational, they're in your face. But they're not without hope. Because see, three chapters later, that hope is fulfilled. And Jesus went to the cross on my behalf. On your behalf. And then three days later, God raised him from the dead, proving that the cross was sufficient. So choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Get rid of the roadblock, whatever you've established in your life that says this far and no further. Be willing to go as far as God will take you. Be willing to pray, pay that price. I want to stand before Him and have something to lay at His feet. I want to stand before Him and have my life have been an honor to Him. I want jewels in my crown so that I can cast them at his feet. Not because of me. Not because of me. <coughs> Quite honestly, people, I have nothing to offer you. Absolutely nothing. My own flesh, I'd sleep in on Sundays. I wouldn't spend time in the Word. I certainly wouldn't be spending time in the Word to share anything with you. I'm selfish. But when God comes inside of you, He changes you. He does things that are unexpected. He takes a kid that said maybe four words a day. Up until he was married. And then I jumped to six. <laughs> and here I sit, talking for 45 minutes. That's not me. That's God. And He will do for you marvelous, incredible, awesome things to His glory. To His glory. brokenness to you. I ask, Lord God, 
that we would open wide the floodgates of our heart and invite you inside to do as you will, Father, that there would be no hidden places, no places that we would reserve for ourselves. God, that it would be completely, totally, infinitely yours. Father, take this life and do with it as you will. God, that this life would honor you, that this life would bring you glory, whatever form or fashion you would choose to do so. I ask, Lord God, for my brothers and sisters here today, that you would strengthen them in their walks, that you would strengthen them in their willingness to be weak. Father, to lay down their rights, their privileges, their own abilities, to lay them down before you and to embrace everything that you have for them. Father, let us fix our eyes firmly on the prize and run this race with endurance as though to win that prize. You've never said, Father, that it was going to be easy, but you have said you would be with us every step of the way, that it would be your strength that sustains us. But Father, I just ask right now, if there are any today that are struggling, God, that you would speak to their heart, that you would set them free from whatever binds them. Father, that their hearts would be open to you and that you would do a miracle again in their lives. Over and over and over, you have shown us your power. I ask again today, Father, that you would demonstrate your power, that you might be glorified. We bless you today. I thank you, God. I thank you, Father, for allowing things to get hard so that I might throw myself before you. We bless you, Father, in the name of your precious Son, Jesus.